Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here in TNO, the last days of Europe, in which we are exploring the North Russian Liberation Front. The unofficial successor to the West Russian Revolutionary Front of all. The North Russian Liberation Front is a state made up of slaves, partisans, former military officers, natives, and other figures desperate and pragmatic enough to survive ten years of the Holy Russian Empire's apocalyptic rule. With their faith and ideology shattered, they have no illusions that Russia may be safe from the latest round of warlordism, but the North Russian Liberation Front, regardless, will stand to ensure that the boot of dudism will never again fall across Russia, and that the Russian people shall forever endure. And we are led by... a Red Star. No, Altunin. Hello, Altunin. If you'd like to read about him, please go right ahead, but Fallen Angels... The dirt trail led to an unmocked grave in one grove among many. Wolves howled with winter's chill some far distance away. Shivering, he held her closer to his torn vatnik and trudged forward. Nature had long reclaimed the grave for its disuse. Weeds grew and roots crept along its narrow walkways, and the brambles around it became heavy, snow-crusted thickets that engulfed the rotting poles of what once was a wooden fence. Concrete and rusted rebar jutted from the clearing centerpiece, a small mound inscribed with stone. See, near the makeshift headstone, amid the crude invectives and Jewish stars, was etched a small hammer and sickle. He ran a thumb on, or a thumb on the faded red insignia. A hero, it said, rested here. Shlomoviki never could do these signs away, no matter how many heroes they slew at the Mad Region's behest, yet they were all slain in droves regardless, leaving the meek and the cowardly to emulate their deeds for the people's sake. Like him, once a lowly figure among the Zukovs and Tukhachevskis of the Red Army, and now the only one among his peers to outlast the Empire, they left him their, with their legacy. Millions of starving stomachs and Russia's least arable land, this side of the Euros, so much sadder on so small a man. Perhaps that was what brought Alexander Altun in here, kneeling on a tomb and forgotten by everyone save maybe God. As the pale moon glowed wanely and the cold bit into his skin, if he murmured the right words and stayed long enough, then maybe a proper hero would rise from his slumber and save Russia from a slow, painful death. Yet Clement of Oroshlov slumbers, still unheeding. And with the national spirits, nothing left but the people. Wow, that's a lot, not a lot of political power, but a lot of defense of core territory, an unthinkable position, unthinkable position, as well as a very salted earth. Oh boy. The bear and the lion. But let's go do some technology first, so we shall get some strellas. Oh, we are certainly understand your plight, General, said His Excellency the diplomatic, uh, the French, the French, the Finnish diplomat said, You need help wherever found, but we need assurances that our charity is misplaced. Helsinki invited Altunin and his entourage to a small compound in the outskirts of Karelia. A respectable distance from Anislina, the squat concrete gray edifice defied the endless white landscape while still enjoying civilization's amenities, electric lamps, thermostats, toilets, feasts, Finnish hospitality left the general warm for the first time in years. It should have anticipated Finnish deceit long before the diplomat offered vodka. Pride would have spirited them back to Ak Angelsk. They may not even have left it all at last. Now, they were in Finland. Facing a dilemma with only a single answer. No, two nations can coexist without respecting each other's sovereignty. The diplomat continued. A vacuous proclamations may suffice now, but in ten years' time, when our children may yet stare at the Soviet cannons from across the Neva, the diplomat tapped at the leather-bound treaty on the dinner table. That's what ink and paper is for. Some recess in Alexander's mind conjured moments studiously lent in Novosibirsk. His namesake Nevsky on Shudskoya Lake. Polsharsky and Minin in Moscow, princes and boyars breaking the Tsar yoke and Kulikovo, anything to will him to resist the invader trampling upon a sacred Russian soil. This man, this, this spent man, felt nothing, and so he muttered tired goodbyes at his signature grace, uh, Sumolayets Bargen. Goodbye, Mermans, goodbye, Petrozovsk, goodbye, Olonets. Oh no, but we're, we, of course, Zukov has a lot of authoritarian socialism. We have a little bit of libertarian socialism with Rezkov. We have social democracy under Alexander Yokolov, and of course, Altunin is leading with des despotism but cold comfort. Send in the next one. Send in the next one, said Dr. Aino Himilia hoarsely, rubbing his baggy eyes with gloved hands, half caked in dry blood. The pavilion tent wrinkled a dank, scurried stench. As the blood and organs hastrewn about mingled with hydro hydrogen peroxide, between the screaming from within and the inexhaustible refugees' rancor without. His sleep-driven team spent these moments of respite in silence. The tents flapped open, revealing Alexei, Ismo, and a whimpering child on a stretcher. His left leg was wrapped up in to the knee in scraps of cloth and dirty gauze, dark blood oozing through the thin fabric. As the medics left, I know, and his team gathered around the boy for another operation among so far too many. 
Surgical knives cut through the sticky linen. Two lasers peeled off layers of gauze while Rita told the boy everything would be fine. His wound was laid bare for all to see. The boy screamed. Rita and Hezja sobbed. Someone could be Veno, could be Avert. Expelled their lunch under the tent's thin walls. Time slowed for Aino, and his eyes grew eyesight grew ever clearer, as if he could pinpoint every pulse seal. Bone poor and black and vain on what used to be a leg. He had first heard of the Taborite and Kumpula. Chlorine, trifluoride, and ha more besides, said the Department of Chemistry. Tissue death in half a minute and necrosis in five, said Dr. Vena Moonen. Few survive before they can even feel their skin rot and peel off, so was this boy lucky or not? Dr. Aino shook his head. As the world around him returned, no time to waste with half a healthy limb. Vino, he shouted, breath shaking, get me the bone saw. Remember your oath, son of Asclepius. Oh man, that is oh, quite painful. Oh my goodness. We've outlawed slavery, we've open refugee uh, programs, no draft exemptions for your draft. Support weapons? Alright, you want some support weapons? You can have some support weapons. Doesn't matter to us. Economy laws, high taxes, limited exports, oh, illegal child labor, why? Low pensions, no employment subsidies, huh. but not too proud to beg. And in the spirit of human fraternity, we enjoin you to send assistance for Russia's blighted lands, larger hacking fits racked Grand Marshal Altunen as he wrote an, on an old memorandum, doubling over against his desk for support. The oil lamp's embers danced with every cough and cast erratic shadows all over his dilapidated office. It was a quiet night otherwise, only crickets and the moon sparkled waves of the northern Vina. Crest hither and yon reprieved Archangelsk from midnight's ambient silence. Alexander reached for a napkin, wiping blood, spitting and sputting them off his lips and table. Sighing, he picked up his fountain pen and finished his letter to be King of England. It laid with the seal, it fixed a ton top, a pile of letters, each addressed to different men from different nations, but all carrying the same incessant appeal. These were the prospect, or the product, of sleepless nights between which Dr. Bragninsky had urged him to rest. The Grand Marshal was no ignorant fool. He'd seen Stavka's estimates, 20 Russians an hour lost to hunger. A full night's sleep would contain or condemn a century and a half. Better he catch sickness putting food on a peasant's table than lose a company after every night after every nap. With perfect timing, Vasya barged in as his cops returned. Alexander all but shoved the letter pile onto a secretary's purse and to the Finnish embassy, he said in between heaves. They'll know what to do with it. <clears throat> that was one batch done for the night. Another awaits come daybreak. A mongrel in uniform no matter the hour, if only. For at least mongrels have scraps to eat. And it looks like we're improving ourselves quite a bit for our society. Academic base, research facilities, agriculture, even poverty, industrial equipment, industrial expertise, army professionalism, everything is improving except for our nuclear stockpile, but little defeats. His wordless screams reverberated across the empty room, feeble fists shaking. As he lurched to the ground, Alexander pummeled the rotting wooden floor once, twice, thrice, punctuating each blow with pain bellows and again and again and again. Blood trickled and oozed and strained from his palms and his cord strained until it snapped and he howled no longer. The pitiful man choked a shallow breath as he laid there, prostrate speechless. Shakily, he knelt up, sifting through broken chairs and broken glass until he met face to face with a fount of all of his woes. Glimmered eyes pierced holes up and down the crumpled, bloodied paper as a faithless man prayed to every god he knew that its contents were false. That some divine inspiration would smite its wrongs and assure him all was well. Years hiding like mice from the Shtomoviki. Months hoarding Russia out to the road for morsels. Sleepless weeks staving off Laryanov, Milikik. Famine. Petty gains his own bad word men from overdrinking. All for today when they promised A would come. Promised enough to feed his people. Not a hundredth, not a tenth, not a fifth. But every Russian under his charge. It had to be enough. Right? Right? <clears throat> Minutes came and hours went. No god answered his hollow prayers. No miracles changed a manifest tally. Barely enough to feed a third of Archangels and only Archangels for a week. No more help will come for Alexander Altunen, the Red Army's disappointment. He was now alone, abandoned, useless. So the useless disappointment sobbed as he tucked himself inwards. The tears flowed louder than the whispers called for Mama, for his voice was found wanting like everything he had built. But that is the end of the North Russian Liberation Front. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.